Wednesday night, Brett had an excellent lesson on the family, and I thought, well, I need to preach more on that subject myself because it is sorely needed in our country today. And the lesson tonight is simply, husbands are the spiritual leaders of the home. And there are five points that we want to emphasize. And what's interesting is, I got all five points from a woman who is a Christian writer who is talking about these things. So if you say, well, he's being chauvinist or whatever, then you know that's not true because my list came from this individual lady. But I knew what she mentioned already, went through the list and said that's exactly right. And there's much more to the subject than, than of course, we can talk about tonight. And not everything I'm going to show you came from that article that I read, but uh, the one thing I wanted to do is to show you that uh, this is actually the case. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. And we're familiar with verses 22 through 24, where there it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let their wives be to their own husbands in everything. Well, if the wife in the Christian home is to be subject to her husband, then who's the leader? The husband is. But to kind of show you from a backdoor kind of way of looking at that, do you remember how Ananias and Sapphira went in Acts chapter 5? Take a look at that and think, well, what's that got to do with anything? Well, it has everything to do with my point. In Acts chapter 5, we know that Ananias and Sapphira sold property and gave some of the proceeds to the apostles and said that was the whole amount we sold it for. And in doing so, lied not to the apostles, but to God. And so we remember the story, it says in verse 3, beginning there, Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled you, your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last, so great fear came on all those who heard these things. Young men picked him up, wrapped him up, and buried him. But that's not my point. In verse 7 it says, About three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together? To test the spirit of the Lord, look, the, hus- the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. You see, Ananias was held accountable for lying to the Holy Spirit, but when Sapphira came in, she was complicit in the deception. I can't help but think that Ananias was the man who had the idea, who said, let's do this. And as a good wife, perhaps, Sapphira thought, well, I'll go along with my husband because he's my husband. And in doing so, caused both of them to lose their life. That's what happens when husbands don't take the proper lead in the family, and we need to keep that in mind. So again, while the Bible says, wives, submit to your husband, you do so as to the Lord. You don't follow him into error, but you follow him because he's to be the savior of the family. And certainly, men, that should be your job and your responsibility. What are five ways that men can be leaders in their family? Well, number one, be an imitator. First John chapter 4 and verse 19 said, we love him because he first loved us. So a Christian man loves his wife and his children because he's the head of the family. God was the initiator in the relationship between us and God. Christ is the groom and we're the bride and we love him because he first loved us. So the lesson we learn from that is husbands, take the initial step. Take the first step. Love your wife as Christ loved the church means pursuing her well-being to maintain not only your relationship with her, but her relationship with the Lord. Husbands say, well, that's not my job, that's her job. No, that's your job too. 
Your heirs together, Peter says in 1 Peter 3, heirs together in the grace of life. And if the husband sets the tone at the home as to how spiritually minded the home's going to be and how much God is first in the family's life, then it's the husband's responsibility to be the imitator and say, I'm going to love my wife because Christ loved me first. Does that make sense? And yet we need to understand that loving your wife involves acting, not just saying. So husbands in leading the home say, well, I need to devise a plan as to how we're going to be a Christian family. I need to enact that plan. It needs to be motivated by love, love for God and love for my wife and children. And then you can develop solutions with your wife and drive your family toward a godly solution whenever there are problems that arise within the home. And so that's, again, the husband leading Devising spiritual plans, motivating it by love, even brainstorming with your wife and saying, here's the problem we have in our home, how can we fix the problem? And a lot of the Christian homes I know about do that very thing. I've been in a lot of homes lately where they said, well, our solution is we took the TV out of the house. We just can't have that here anymore. Fine, you don't have to do that. But if that's a solution that a husband and wife think is good and will put God first, then fine. Uh, There's other problems we might see arise in the home. It's like, well, we have too much worldliness in the home, so, well, you can control that in your own house. But I'm illustrating that to show you that by encouraging prayer and devotions and talking about God, talking about how to solve our problems, talking about what it takes to be a godly family are all part of the husband's responsibility in being an imitator of God because you're taking the the initial step because God took it for us. So imitate him. Number two, lead spiritually. A lot of husbands think that being the head of the family means being the brutal boss. I'm the head of this family and I'm going to do what I think I want to do. No, that's the exact opposite attitude that a leader should have. In Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 12, it talks about the power of two. Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. There's power in unity. If husband and wife and God are bound together as a threefold cord, then the family is going to be a very strong, powerful unit that can overcome all the obstacles that life might throw at it. And guess who the foundation is in that home? As I've said, you have husband and wife and God. That's a threefold cord, but Christ is the foundation. If the Bible is not the answer for our problems at home, then we don't have the right foundation. You know what Jesus said about that, don't you? Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to the wise man who built his house upon the rock. And he who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, I will liken him unto the man who built his house upon the sand. Which is easier? To build on the sand to go along with the attitudes and whims and concepts of the world we live in and fit right in with the world, but we're building on sand. It's a false foundation. And you say, well, it's easier to build on the sand, but it's safer to build on the rock because you know the rest of the story. You can't tell the difference until the hard times come. And that's applicable to the family. We have rampant divorce. We have homosexual marriages, as we like to call it. We have all these things in our society that are damaging and destroying the home. And that's why we have to build our home upon the rock of Jesus Christ. Because when the storm comes and the rains fall and the winds blow and the flood rises up and beats against the house, only the one built on the rock is going to stand. So young women, look for a husband that will lead you toward heaven. Husbands, if young men, if you're going to be a husband someday, realize what your responsibility is. It's not just saying, well, we're going to buy this car and this house, and I'm going to control the bank account. It has nothing really to do with that whatsoever. It has everything to do with the tone you set in your family as to how dedicated you're going to be to Jesus Christ. We know Joshua 24 and verse 15 back in the Old Testament when Israel was going into the promised land and Joshua was trying to instruct the, the families of the Israelites. And he says, if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, then choose to serve the gods whom your fathers worshipped on the other side of the river. 
But as for me in my house, we will what? Serve, Serve the Lord. Lord. Joshua was a spiritual leader in his family, and he made the decision that God wants him to make. So again, when a man is deeply committed himself to Jesus Christ, it can't help but affect the family. It's not a matter of bossing the wife around or bossing the kids around. It's a matter of being like Christ and people wanting to be like you because you're such a godly person. You follow and pursue godly principles in the Bible. You show your concern for your family's spiritual well-being. Jesus followed everything as Clyde taught us in our class this morning. He did everything the Father commanded him to do because he loved the Father and a godly husband will be followed the same way as Jesus followed his father. So keep that in mind. Husbands, be committed to God on your own. Pray to God. Study your Bible. Talk about it in your home. When you hear political comments, talk about them in light of what the scriptures have to say. Don't just join a party because you think that party is going to fill your bank account better. Or give you some kind of earthly rights that won't amount to much in a few years. Make your decision based on God and His Word. And that's the husband's responsibility. Number three, lead by examples. The Bible says, therefore be imitators of God as dear children. Well, all Christians should be imitators of God. But how much more the husband who is the leader of the home. And so again, it's not a matter of just wearing the pants in the families we say. Leading by example doesn't mean you know all the answers and you make all the rules. What it does mean is that when you set a godly example, it's easy for others to follow. I've often said in Ephesians 5 when it says, Husbands, love your wives how? As Christ loved the church. If a man does that, he will never have any family problems. Unless his wife's crazy and his kids don't have any sense. And I guess that happens, but that wouldn't be the case generally speaking, and that's an exception to the rule. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, it says, We walk by faith, not by sight. But again, what does that mean in the home? We walk by faith. What do you do? Get a Bible and walk on it? You make sure you have a whole path full of Bibles. So that's not walking by faith. Walking by faith is the Bible tells you what you believe about everything. The Bible tells you as a Christian what you're supposed to do, where you're supposed to go, with whom you're supposed to associate, what you're supposed to do with your children, how you're to love them and guide them and direct them. That's walking by faith. And so many times I think we walk by the media. That's sight. And it's wrong. And so husbands, I say, well, I want to be a spiritual leader in my family, so what all does that involve? A lot of things, but... For example, in Ephesians 4 and verse 19, excuse me, 29, Ephesians 4, 29, the Bible says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Talk in such a way in your home to your wife and children that they know you love them. Speak kindly and gracefully and not harshly and cruelly. Let other people see Jesus Christ in you. And that's just one way in which the husband can have a tremendous influence on the home. I know Emily said many times when I was young and our children were small, I'd come home and I might be upset or mad about something that had happened. And then she said, when you walked in the door, it was like ice just poured all over the whole house. Oh no, dad's home and he's mad. <laughs> well, husbands, you know how that works. And if you don't, ask your wife and children. Are you that grumpy guy that walks in the door and all of a sudden everybody's walking on pins and needles? If so, you're not setting the kind of example that you should. I remember a story long, long ago about a husband and wife that lived on a farm. And they both from time to time would be irritable and not happy because no matter how hard you try, you just have those bad days, right? So they figured out, well, now how are we going to kind of warn each other before we meet? Because he'd walk in the door mad and maybe she was angry. And so they just get into a fuss immediately. So they said, we've got to solve this problem. So he said, I'll tell you what, when I come home, if I'm in a bad mood, I'm going to roll up one pant leg higher than the other. When you see me walking up the driveway, uh, you know I'm, in, I'm mad. She said, fine, then when, when you come home, if I'm having a bad day, then I take my apron and I fold it halfway up and tie it behind me. And if you know I've got a shortened apron, then I'm mad. 
He said, what are we going to do if we both show up the same way? <laughs> you hope that you don't both have that same day. If you do, maybe just turn and go the other direction for a while. But at least they're trying to solve their problems and be the kind, loving person that God wants them to be. And so lead by example doesn't mean you know everything. Husbands, one of the best things you can do is say, I'm sorry I made a mistake. I'm sorry I became angry and I shouldn't have. I'm sorry I said something off the cuff. And wives will love that and respect that because I've not yet met the perfect husband or the perfect father. And so being able to recognize our mistakes and admit them is a great way of being Christ-like. Set the godly example that others will follow. Number four, love unconditionally. And that goes back to Ephesians 5, 25 through 28. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And so it says that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Now read that and think about the husband-wife relationship. And here's the conclusion that just jumps out at me. And what it's saying is, husbands, you want to make your marriage to your wife cause her to be a better human being because she's married to you than she would ever be without you. Because we would be nothing without Christ. Christ loved us and gave himself for us on the cross to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. He died in our place. His blood is, should have been our blood. And he did that sacrificially. He did that lovingly. He did that when it was very, very difficult. And yet he did it because he wanted to wash his wife, his bride, the church, with his tears and with his blood. And when it says that in Ephesians 5, and it says later on, this is a great mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. But primarily or secondarily, there's the explanation of that's how a relationship between a Christian husband and a Christian wife should be as well. So that she will not have any spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves who? Himself. Because if your wife is happy, you'll be happy. And if the family is happy, then all will be as God wants it to be. And so husbands have authority without superiority. Because we know we're not talking about anything other than roles. Men and women are equal in God's eyes. They're both made in God's image. But the husband has the role of being the spiritual leader. The wife has the role of being a spiritual follower, but also having tremendous input because they are both equal in God's eyes. And so he may be the leader, but he's not superior. And so they just have the different roles the Bible teaches. In 1 Corinthians 16, verses 12 and, or 13 and 14, again, the Apostle Paul talked about leading by love. And he says in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 and 14, Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong, let all that you do be done with love. Now think about that. That's a good passage for husbands to put on their mirror in the morning when they're shaving. Watch. Watch, watch out for the bad and look for the good. Stand fast in the faith. Ask yourself, am I being faithful, Lord, or am I drifting away slowly but surely? Be brave. It takes courage to be a man and to stand up. Be strong. You have to overcome the wiles of the devil. But let all that you do be done in love. What a wonderful description for all Christians, but especially for husbands. And then in Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, we see again another instruction similar to that. In Colossians 3, verses 12 and 13, the Bible says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. That's true in every relationship that we have. And yet how hard it is to read those words and to say, really, that describes me. But husbands, that's what your responsibility is as well. Jesus encourages us to be kind, to be compassionate, 
to be quick to forgive and not to hold a grudge. Bitterness never made a family better. So Jesus Christ sets the tone in his message. He loves even his enemies because he's like his own father in heaven, and so should we. Jesus, if you go back and read the account of his life, always took time. It seemed like more so for the downtrodden than for anyone else. But he took time to listen and then to ask questions. And husbands, if you need an example of that, go to John chapter 4 and read how Jesus dealt with a woman at the well. Because he sits down and asks her for a cup of water. And immediately that began a conversation. What are you doing asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a cup of water? Because the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Well, Jesus begins to say, well, if you knew who I was, then you'd ask me for water. You see how the conversation turned immediately to a spiritual overtone, and Jesus began to teach this woman, and I believe converted her, and many others in that city. But the kindness and compassion that he showed to this woman was just amazing, and that's the kind of attitude that we as husbands should demonstrate as well. And the final point is lead by serving. Look at John chapter 13, verses 3 through 5. And again, this is contrary to the world's concept of being a leader. They think to be a leader, you have to drive the biggest car, have the fanciest house, and the biggest paycheck. If you don't think so, check out the CEO's income these days. That's the, that's the top of the heap. If you want to be successful, be a CEO. Well, look what those people make. 30, 40, 50 times the average employee. You say, well, they're successful in life. They, they, reached, they managed to reach the top. Well, with that in mind, that doesn't help us understand what Jesus does in John 13. Because in verse 3 it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands. Now again, keep in mind where we're at. Jesus is about to be crucified. He's about to be betrayed. He's got a world of worry on his mind. And we see that when he prays in the Garden of Gethsemane, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And as he's praying, he's worrying sick. Sweat is pouring off his forehead because of the tremendous stress that he's under. And I think it's worse knowing what's coming in the next day or so than to not know. But he knows he's known his whole life. And yet sitting here in this passage with all this stress on him, it says, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and that he had come from God and was what? Going to God. He's accepted his death rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. The most menial task that a Jewish man could ever practice is what Jesus used to teach an example. I remember when I was in the eighth grade in Conway, Arkansas, we had, I worked in the library, and there was three others that worked in there, and we always had Bible discussions because all of us went to church. One of them went to a church that practiced foot washing. And this girl came up to me, she said, you're not a sound church. I said, well, I'm insulted by that. What makes you say that? Well, you people don't practice foot washing. Well, this is the passage she went to. This is not a church ordinance. This isn't like the Lord's Supper, but that's how they had made it. But what Jesus is teaching is not an ordinance, but a principle. And the principle is, if you want to be great in the Lord's kingdom, you need to serve. Because the greatest in the kingdom is Jesus Christ. We don't need to be told that. Remember Ephesians chapter 1? God gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. And he's the head of all spiritual power in heaven and on earth. And yet this one who has all power takes the time to find the worst possible job of washing people's feet and teaching his disciples, that's what I want you to be. You want to be great in the kingdom, then you be a servant. You want to be a great husband and father in the family, then you serve your family. That's really the application we're making tonight. But I like to read the rest of this because it came to Simon Peter, and I always say that in a good class, you need a Simon Peter around who's going to say, now wait a minute, what's going on here? The rest of them were probably too timid and didn't understand what Jesus was doing, so they just sat back and let it happen. But he said, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. 
Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Peter had such reverence and respect because you remember, it wasn't that long ago that Jesus came to the twelve and said, who do men say that I the son of man am? And they said to Moses, uh, said Elijah, uh, Jeremiah, one of the prophets, who do you say that I am? You're the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter is saying, the Christ, the Son of the living God, is not going to do a servant's job on me. And wouldn't you say the same thing? Wouldn't you think that? We put our leaders on a high pedestal. We honor them. We praise them. We give them all the blessings we've been talking about. And yet Jesus is turning it completely upside down. And Peter finally speaks up and says, I'm not going to let you do that. But the Lord said, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And so Peter said the right thing, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Great humility on the part of Peter, who was a great leader, by the way. And when he didn't understand something, he saw a problem, he objected. But what the problem was, he didn't understand what Jesus was doing. So as he goes to let him do that, he finishes the job. We skip down to about verse 13, and he says, you call me teacher and what? Lord. And you say, well, for so I am. Jesus has not capitulated his position. When he rose from the dead, not long after this event, he said, all power has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So he said, I am your master, I am your Lord. But he said, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you what? An example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And then when the apostles went out and preached the gospel to the whole world, did they go around bossing people around? No, they were kind and gentle and loving. They preached the word. They preached it firmly. They preached it boldly. They were unafraid. Even the enemy said, these men have been with Jesus. But they did so in such a way that it invited people to love and to obey Jesus Christ. So again, an essential aspect of leadership in the Christian system is sacrificial leadership. Sacrificial service. And again, in Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 28, Jesus explained this concept to the apostles. He says in Matthew chapter 20, beginning at verse 25... Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So that's something you and I need to always think about in every relationship. Husband, you're the leader. Be a servant. Be the best servant you can be. That's what Jesus did. It doesn't mean you give up your position of head. It doesn't mean that you're a wimp and you let everybody run over you. It simply means that you do what's in the other's best interest that you have the power to do something about. Make your family blessed because you are the husband and the father. In Philippians 4 and verse 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I think we can all agree that those are five good principles. And so many Christian homes lack these very qualities. And all of us, whether husband or wives, brothers, sisters, sons or daughters, can all take these same principles and apply them to ourselves because all of us have a position of authority or leadership some way or another. And if we will practice these things that we've learned tonight, we will be better for it. Our nation has put God's family, the song we sang, God Give Us Christian Homes, really preached the sermon that I'm preaching tonight. And if you sang that in public to the world right now, they would laugh you out of the square. But that's still what God intended. And the Bible says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Till the end of time. The Christian home that Jesus Christ built and authored and told us about will stand forever. But our nation has put the God-planned family under attack. We have transgender confusion. Young people today don't know whether they're male or female or something else. 
Homosexuality, when it ends up in a homosexual marriage, leaves the home 50% blank of one of the genders and their attributes. A high divorce rate due to a man's infidelity has destroyed the home out of selfishness. And they call this a home, which is nothing like God intended. So again, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. So we call upon godly men, when you become a husband and a father, to be one that God would be proud of. Follow his blueprint, it's the right one. God built the home and he knows what it's all about. If you're a husband now and you haven't been the leader that you ought to be, let this lesson be an encouragement to you so that you will. It's a blueprint that is foolproof if you'll put it to practice. And it won't guarantee that your wife will be faithful to the Lord or that your children will be faithful to the Lord. But what it will guarantee is that you've done all that you can do to make that possible. So again, husbands, men, look at yourself and say, am I the Christian leader that God wants me to be? And if not, when are you going to start? I'd recommend you start tonight. And if you need to begin with yourself by believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized, that's a great thing to do to save your soul and a great role for others to follow. If you're a child of God and you've fallen by the wayside and you've sinned in a public way and you need to make correction, again, a godly man admits his errors when he's wrong. Jesus Christ said, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the humble. For they shall receive the blessings that God has to offer. So in humility, confess your sins. Ask the church to pray for you. We will and God will forgive you, bless you, and make your days on this earth happier from this day forward. We walk by faith, so take God's word and follow it. It will work if you'll practice it. Won't you do so while we stand and sing tonight?